thousand songs. And it goes right in my pocket. Failure of the future has to be a nation that is agile, that is innovative, that is creative. In our best Welcome to Future Square, the podcast all about innovation in the enterprise, brought to you and run by Collective Campus, an innovation hub based in Australia that works with companies to help them adopt the mindset, methodologies, and tools to successfully explore new business models and disruptive innovation in an era of rapid change. For more information, go to www.collectivecamp.us. And without further ado, here's today's podcast. Welcome back to Future Squared. Today I'll be bringing you Dave Gray. He's an author and management consultant who works with the world's leading companies to develop and execute winning strategies. He's the founder of Explain, a strategic design consultancy and co-founder of BoardThink, a collaboration platform for distributed teams. He is the author of two books on design, change, and innovation, including Gamestorming, a playbook for innovators, rule breakers, and change makers, which has sold more than 50,000 copies and has been translated into 14 languages. His area of focus is on the human side of change and innovation, specifically how you can get people to adopt new ideas. How can you win their hearts and minds? How can you get people, including yourself, to change deeply embedded habits and behaviors? And how can you transform a business strategy from a good idea to a living fact in the real world? Today, I'll be speaking with him predominantly about the Culture Map, a tool that he co-created with Alex Osterwalder, who developed the incredibly popular business model Canvas. So if you're struggling with culture change in your organization, then you will definitely get a lot of value out of this podcast. So without further ado, I bring you Dave Gray. Welcome to the show, Dave. Thanks. Great to be here, Steve. No, it's an absolute pleasure to have you on the show. Uh, you are joining us from St. Louis in Missouri. Is that right? That is correct. Fantastic. Um, did, is that your hometown? Did you grow up in that part of the, of the world? No, I grew up uh, kind of all over the place. Mostly Massachusetts, which is on the East Coast. Uh huh. Fantastic. What brought what brought what brought you to uh, St. Louis? <laughs> I accidentally applied for a job here. <laughs> ah, <laughs> fair enough. Who was who was that job with? Well, I was living in Seattle at the time, and uh, I was uh, there was a convention of art educators, mm-hmm. which had all the schools, all the art schools were converging on this convention in Seattle. And I, I applied to all the uh, schools in uh, that were near and in around Seattle, which is in the state of Washington. Mm-hmm. And uh, there is a school called Washington University School of Art, which happens to be in St. Louis. And uh, I thought, I didn't know. I thought it was in Washington State. So I accidentally <laughs> applied for it. And uh, lo and behold, I got the job. So uh, that was more than 20 years ago. Wow. Well, well, we'll see. Well, it doesn't sound like you regretted that decision, seeing as you've uh, managed to stay there for for 20 odd years. Not at all. Yeah, fantastic. And you made your way down under last year. You were here for a few um, workshops. Was that your first time down in Australia? Uh, It was my second time, but my first time was uh, literally one night. I I, I came for business circumstances that were sort of outside of my control I basically could only be there for one night so I flew mm-hmm. the 30 hour I took the 30 hour uh, flight there and the 30 hour or so wow. of, uh, flight back only to be there for one night so for all intents and purposes yeah it was my first time yeah fantastic I'm, I'm, I'm sure it was uh, I'm sure the return on investment was there despite that uh, 60 hour cumulative flight time <laughs> well this, uh, this last time I, I learned my lesson so this last time when I came, uh, which was the second time, I stayed for about a month. I had mm-hmm. a wonderful visit and uh, got to visit uh, Melbourne, Sydney, and um, and Brisbane, mm-hmm. and uh, got to meet with a lot of interesting people and had a really great time. Fantastic. And I only have one more question about your trip down under. Melbourne or Sydney? <laughs> I know enough not to touch that one. <laughs> smart move, smart move. <laughs> Okay, um, so I wanted to talk to you today, Dave, about uh, some of the, the work you're doing in the culture space. Um, so while many companies are investing um, in training their employees, methods such as the Lean Startup, rapid experimentation, um, essentially these behaviors 
often fly in the face of the ethos of many large organizations that are built upon avoiding failure at all costs, uh, mitigating risk to the nth degree. I mean, for example, we had uh, GE uh, train 5,000 middle managers. I believe they had Eric Ries and David Kidder train 5,000 middle managers in the lean startup. But those middle managers quickly found that once they got back to their respective business units, um, back to a culture that was steeped in Six Sigma thinking and one that didn't really value customer feedback early in the product development lifecycle, um, it, it became quite apparent um, that culture essentially comes first and any type of transformational program or new business launch where a different way of thinking is required um, oftentimes doesn't really uh, fit into that existing culture. Um, how, how have you seen this play out yourself? Well, culture is fascinating. I, mm. I, I got interested in culture, so I've been um, working in large organizations in one way or another on change and uh, transformation initiatives of one kind or another for more than 20 years. Mm -hmm. so everything from rolling out uh, a new technology like a SAP implementation, you know, where people are going to have to change uh, the way they work to um, uh, new product launches and, um, you know, business shifts and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And culture is a fuzzy word. It, it's something that a lot of people have trouble grasping mm -hmm. or getting... When you say culture, what does that mean? I think it's one of those things like, um, I think it was an American judge who said this about pornography. Uh, I can't define it, but I know it when I see it. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so there's a, but there's also, I think, a tendency to when, because it is so fuzzy and, mm -hmm. big and hard to pin down and define, it's also easy to blame when things fail, blame it on culture. And mm. so I have, you know, I've seen initiatives that succeed, I've seen initiatives that fail. I've, because of my position as a management consultant, I uh, have a privilege of experiencing a lot yeah. of different organizational cultures. And you walk in the door of, uh, of an organization and instantly almost you can feel uh, the differences between that organization and this other one, or, you know, whether it's formal or informal, whether it's uh, um, uh, uh, collaborative or mm -hmm. territorial, etc. Um, metrics, you know, driven or, uh, you know, it's like a really team. There are so many different kinds of uh, corporate cultures sure. that's hard to define them. But w one thing that I did notice is that people will, uh, when things fail, it's mm -hmm. easy to blame culture. And when you ask people, what do you mean by that? Sometimes they fall down because culture is just a convenient excuse yeah. sometimes. Yeah. And it, it's, if you don't know why something failed, you're going to blame the culture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's, it's, I guess it's human nature to want to uh, externalize and look for something to point the blame on rather than try and find a solution. It is probably human nature. Mm. So I think there's a, there's a tendency. So I, but I had heard it enough. You know, what we, why, 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 what's, what went wrong here? Well, the culture rejected it. Mm. It's like an immune system. I've heard people use this metaphor that, well, it was kind of the patient rejected it. Yeah. Uh, the, the company's immune system, the antibodies killed it. We were not able to, uh, you know, it's like an artificial heart was rejected mm. by the patient. Yeah, and have you seen any examples, Dave, of where organizations were embarking upon, say, a Horizon 3 type of uh, innovation program uh, where they were looking to explore disruptive business models and the response was, you know, it basically, well, it fell over but, and the response from everybody was, well, the culture didn't support it. Our culture is steeped in what I mentioned earlier, avoiding risk, avoiding failure at all costs. Um, we tend to outsource decision making. We'll hold a steering committee meeting every time a big decision needs to be made and that takes four or five weeks just to schedule and therefore we can't move at the cadence that's required um, when you're dabbling in, in the dark arts of disruptive innovation. Um, have you seen any examples of that? Oh, I, I have. I, I, I was present in one of maybe the classics, which mm -hmm. is a company called Nokia. Yeah. And I was there when mm -hmm. the iPhone was announced, and a practic almost the day that the iPhone was announced by Steve Jobs, and right. or shortly after. And so, and if you will, if you can recall, Nokia was a company was not a company with. A, that was considered to be a company with a problematic culture. In fact, they were celebrated for their culture. Mm. Uh, they were written up in Harvard Business Review for their culture. They were, 
their culture was held up as a paragon of one of the great corporate cultures of the world. Mm -hmm. And in spite of that, or maybe because of that, they failed to make this very important transition that was a sort of a pivotal moment for the company. Yeah. It was a make or break moment. And that's one of the reasons I started really getting serious about culture because I did see, number one, they had a wonderful culture. Mm. It was a company with a really great culture that was very empowering. Uh, everyone had a voice. There was plenty of time for uh, conversation and deliberation. There was lots of space and meetings for people to talk. Mm -hmm. People really got along. They liked each other. They liked working together. They enjoyed their work. And that was one of my big kind of moments. Like, well, what happened? What, what was the problem? And in fact, what the conclusion that I have come to is that uh, culture is a double-edged sword. It is a, uh, when a culture of an organization is a good fit for the business environment, mm -hmm. then it's a great thing. Yeah. But uh, the business environment is not a stable phenomenon. The business environment is always evolving Correct. in one way or another. Yeah. And I think you'll, you, know, you will see this even in companies like Google. You will see that companies that today are a fantastic fit for the business environment will, over time, if they're not careful and deliberate about culture, will get out of tune or out of sync mm. with that business environment. And as the conditions in the marketplace change, um, I predict you will see companies, even what we could now consider very cutting edge companies, mm -hmm. they will get out of sync or out of tune. In fact, um, uh, I think you know we're seeing uh, recently in the news uh, Dropbox mm -hmm. was uh, cut back on a lot of their perks. Yeah, it was like 30, 35 million dollars or so in uh, perks that they cut back. Things like uh, free lunches or you know bring your friends to a happy hour after mm -hmm. work, um, climbing gym, whatever those things were, they, uh, they cut them back. And uh, what I think, and so one, one of the things that has happened over the, you know, as we've seen the, the large expansion in um, internet or digital organizations, born digital organizations, for lack of a better word, is that they have uh, gone to some pretty severe extremes to attract great talent because yep. they, and that is actually a, a smart move and a good move when you're in an expanded economy or they have a, you're in major growth mode. Mm -hmm. um, but if, if we've learned anything, if I've learned anything in my 20 plus years in business, uh, there is no such thing as infinite growth. Mm. Yeah, I think Everything that... that. Anything that grows will eventually contract. And uh, there is, uh, you will, we will find that um, there is no such thing as, and I've asked, been asked this question, is there such a thing as a perfect culture? Uh, I think we will find that there is no such thing as a perfect culture. Mm -hmm. That what makes a culture, um, culture is a dynamic thing. It's, it is evolving in some ways constantly, but it has to also evolve at the pace of the business environment that the, the organization's in. And that's the real trick. Yeah. Um, but we haven't even defined culture yet, so we're going way off on a, on a tangent there. <laughs> we are, we are. I guess, I mean, you touched on a few interesting points there, Dave. I mean, number one, Nokia. Um, you know, great culture, great company. Um, I think it reminds me of that, that quote um, about innovation where you can do everything right and still fail. Um, you know, based on the definition of, or, or based on the MBA definition of what's right. Um, and most businesses, as you alluded to, um, I suppose they're built to operate in, you know, a stable business environment, or at least the business environment that they found themselves in when they were, when they found product market fit, when they scaled. But as soon as that business environment becomes more ambiguous, changes to something else, then suddenly that organization's culture, their values, their systems, the way they go about doing things suddenly may not work anymore. Well, it's actually, I think, deeper than that. Mm -hmm. there, there are companies like uh, Nokia that were built uh, on the idea of a relatively uh, stable environment. Yes. Although, if you go back and look at Nokia's history, they evolved several times. They started out making rubber boots, and they, mm. they evolved into electricity, and they evolved into uh, wood, timber, um, paper products. 
So they had a, actually quite a, a good history of innovation over mm. many uh, hundreds of years. Um, and they had evolved appropriately. But one thing that, so there are a couple of things that happened in Nokia's case. One was they, one of their strengths was their diversity. They were in a, they were, they were making all these different kinds of products. They were, uh, they were spread across a whole bunch of different um, industries. Mm -hmm. And in the 2000s, they sold all that stuff off so they could focus on mobile phones. Wow. So they basically, they took all the diversity and they sold it off. So that was, I think, a strategic well, I mean, it's blunder. easy to look back, but I think that's a strategic blunder. Um, they, um, and the second thing was that that mobile phone organization had a culture that was very strong in manufacturing. Mm -hmm. uh, that's good when you're making a commodity product. Yep. And when the mobile phone was actually a, um, a more of a physical device that did one thing, mm -hmm. make phone calls, they were very good at that, but a manufacturing culture is also has to be a risk averse culture because it's very expensive to tool up a factory and make stuff. Mm. Uh, when they when the phone the business environment changed, so the phone was no longer a single use device. It became a computer that you carry around in your pocket with all these sensors and the actual thing driving the primary value. If you look at a Android phone and an Apple phone, they are not that different today. Mm -hmm. But what's different is, and what was especially different initially about the uh, uh, the Apple phone was it was the software. Mm -hmm. It was the apps. And so there was a whole different model that had to be uh, designed around the apps and the software when suddenly the computer becomes a device that lets you do anything. Yeah, that's right. And there's a, it's a different business. It's a different. It's suddenly it's a software business, not a hardware business, and that's the what Nokia, which had a wonderful culture for manufacturing, was a very risk averse culture. It was not the right culture for being in a software business, um, or even an operating system business that's enabling software and creating an app, mm. uh, develop, you know, app store. And because what what really sunk Nokia was they couldn't. They couldn't create a platform that developers wanted to develop software on. Mm -hmm. And Apple already had that. So for Apple to take their ecosystem of software developers and all the people who are excited to develop apps on anything Apple, for them to move that ecosystem onto a smaller, more portable device was actually pretty easy. Mm -hmm. And that was something that Nokia missed. They missed the, I think uh, I was there, so I can't say that they missed it. I think they understood it. And that's, the, I guess, the point that were maybe circling around on culture. They understood it intellectually, but culture is not something you only have to understand intellectually. You have to understand it behaviorally, and that means by the actions that you take every day, by the way that you behave in meetings, by the way that you make decisions, mm -hmm. all of those things. And you said that um, uh, most corporate cultures are designed around an environment that's stable, and that's the one thing I did want to uh, push back on a little bit. Sure. Because you look at Google and Amazon and Facebook, you and you know even the lean startup movement. You will see companies that are actually organized for a volatile and ambiguous environment. In fact, Amazon's a great example of a company that's organized around not knowing mm -hmm. what the environment will will deliver. Yeah, and Google as well, and Facebook. I mean, and you could see that you could see these even these large organizations. Um, and this is, I think, the power of the lean startup being organized around uncertainty uh, is is actually a very powerful thing today mm. because we live in a highly volatile, very uncertain uh, world that is pretty much driven by technology. We know we know there's going to be a Facebook of VR. Mm. We know there's going to be one. Uh, is it going to be Facebook? We don't know that. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, and I think you're absolutely right there when it comes to the, the new guard uh, of, of large companies being built for more volatile environments, um, steeped in a culture of lean startup, agile software development, um, and basically being very customer-driven, that customer focus. Um, but I guess when it comes to the old guard, um, a lot of the large telecommunications companies, banks, utilities, um, perhaps they 
tend to be a little bit more built for a stable environment, um, steeped in a culture of waterfall, steeped in a culture of market research, inside the building thinking, not taking anything to market until it's, you know, the most polished um, diamond it could possibly be. Um, and I guess that's more so what I was alluding to when I said large companies are built for stable environments. Um, but um, on, on culture, Dave, I mean, you've recently done some work with a crew of thought leaders, um, including Alex Osterwalder, who is famous for the development of the business model canvas and the value proposition design canvas. And you've come up with the culture map, um, which is being used by organizations around the world to improve the success rates of mergers, acquisitions, uh, reorganization and renewal initiatives, new business launches, strategy initiatives, and other important change projects. Um, can you tell our audience a little bit more about the culture culture map, please. Yeah, well, I'll start by saying if people uh, happen to be familiar with Alex Osterwalder, the business model canvas and mm -hmm. the uh, value proposition canvas, what Alex has uh, done a great job of is uh, helping to create tools mm -hmm. that help with strategic business um, work. And so a lot of the uh, traditional ways of doing business strategy are not very uh, design oriented. Mm. They're very they're very decision oriented, and what I mean by that is um, most in the in the in the older school companies like you're talking about, let's say industrial age yep. organization uh, that were formed in the last century, you you will see what I would call a decision uh, culture at the top, and the decision culture basically is is something that is oriented or for a T t relatively stable environment. Mm -hmm. and decision culture is something that um, asks the organization to come to the, the, the senior executive team with recommendations. Mm -hmm. And uh, there usually is narrowed down somehow to a small pool of decisions. And the decision maker's job is to decide among these options, which one do we pick? Mm -hmm. and the, the problem is when uh, the business environment has radically shifted, it's very likely that those uh, recommendations that come to the executive team are not going to be have enough diversity or broadness in, or scope of thinking. Correct. And so you're, you're, you're faced with three, three choices that were generated within the culture and within the thinking zone of the company, mm -hmm. uh, which are very possibly three bad choices. Mm -hmm. And so the decision makers today are often looking at the pool of the, the pool of you know options that's presented to them and saying well I don't like any of these mm -hmm. and uh, and how do you decide when you have three options put in front of you and they all suck I mean it's yeah just make it you know very uh, uh, to put a not to put a fine point on it and the design orientation is uh, a way for senior executives to actually get involved in expanding that pool of options and opening up that dialogue to to really be a broader and expanding the pool of options is something that most uh, cultures that have been around for a long time have not developed very a very uh, strong culture of mm -hmm. because the environment's been pretty stable yeah it's it, it, ha it hasn't been a question of um, should we even be a bank it used to be a question of, well, you know, which bank, uh, how are we going to be, how are we going to say that we're different from the other banks, even though we're substantially the same? Mm. Well, now it is, what happens when there is no bank? Mm -hmm. Are there even going to be banks? Are, uh, what does a bank mean? Those are the questions. I mean, it, the, the taxi industry did not see Uber coming. That's because right. Uber did not come from the taxi industry. And the, the problem of how to be, be a better taxi company than the other taxi companies is different from what do you do when there's a whole new playing field yeah. with a whole new set of rules. And I know Uber is a, a company you're familiar with because I did mm -hmm. Uber's all, all over when I was there. Yeah. And uh, I, I, I asked a lot of the Uber drivers, it was interesting asking taxi drivers and Uber drivers what they thought of Uber and the taxi, uh, and I got a whole bunch of different answers, which we, hope we could spend a whole hour on, mm. just that. But um, when, when the world has got this much volatility in it, you've got to ask different 
questions. And as a senior executive, you've got to have different approaches and different methods for thinking about strategy. Mm. Yeah, so and that's I, what Alex, I think, did a, such a powerful job in with the business model canvas, yep. with the value proposition design canvas, which were designed and for as tools mm-hmm. for business people to think about launching new products and actually developing new business models. But what Alex and I, uh, what we got together on the culture map, and the reason that we both got together and excited about this, we were friends from way back. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that that got us both excited about this this issue was, well, as soon as you've conceptualized a new business model, then you have a culture problem. Because you now have, let's say you are a taxi company and you figured out how to be better than Uber. That doesn't mean that your driver's and your dispatchers and even your finance people and the other people who are involved in running that organization are going to just go, oh, yeah, great, let's do that now. Yeah. There's a, so culture is about shifting behaviors, deeply embedded routines and habits and behaviors in the company that are so deeply embedded that you don't even notice. You're not even aware of them. Mm. And I, the, 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 um, the thing that I liken it to is I used to be a smoker and, uh, I quit smoking t- more than 20 years ago, but when, when you, uh, you know, when you have a cigarette that's lit and you light another one without even realizing that you have one there that's just lit, that's a, that's a habit that's so deeply embedded you don't even notice. Yeah, that's... organizations are full of habits like this that are so, and only, I'm only able to see them relatively easily because I have the kind of job that enables that where I cross over and, and work with a lot of different companies. Mm. But when you spend the majority of your time in a single company, um, there's a lot that you miss. And we even, this is a kind of an interesting development. Uh, we've had, we've been actually having requests from customers recently. Could we ride along with you with your other coins? Mm-hmm. You know, could we, we had, a, had a, someone from a bank ask me, could, our, could we have our teams ride along with you with a logistics company? Or we'd like to actually do safari in other in other organizations that yeah. are not competitive, but we'd like to see what those different cultures look like, and it it almost is a way to uh, you can't see your own culture until you've been out of it and mm. come back to it. Yeah, yeah. And so, yeah. No, I think you you sorry, Dave. I think you've touched on quite a few few points there that I just wanted to interject. Um, um, basically. Firstly, you talked about senior management, you know, being given three recommendations and then having to pick one. And I guess, you know, I'm reminded of Otto Schirmer's, um, I suppose it's a quote or a saying, but basically his, um, we'll call it a philosophy of moving from the ego system to the ecosystem, where organizations who are, I suppose, more adept at co-creation and collaborating with um, you know, well, I guess cross-functional collaboration firstly within the company, but then engaging their partners, suppliers, um, members of the general public, their customers, are the ones who are going to stand a better chance at competing um, in, in this fast-moving, volatile environment. And you know, you mentioned you're a management consultant, and therefore you get to visit lots of different companies, and I guess you're able to see things that other people don't because of the associational thinking um, that comes with that. And I guess it the underlying theme that I'm seeing or that I'm getting here is more about um, co-creation and maybe adopting more of that Socratic thinking, which is all I know is I know nothing and we need to get out of the building and find the answers. Yeah, well, yes. And we're in a stage right now in history where there's greater fluidity in what a market is Mm -hmm. than than perhaps ever in the recent past. There's opportunities to create markets, rewire, reconfigure uh, whole markets, create whole new marketplaces, uh, new, mm-hmm. new business environments. And, but in order to rewire your market, you're going to have to rewire your company. And in order to rewire your company, you have to rewire your own mind and the minds of the people in the organization. And that's what culture change becomes an issue. You can, you can look at a, you can, you can intellectually see a market emerging or a market space emerging um, you can even intellectually rewire your company you can have a blueprint for that mm-hmm. but then the the real tr- traction you can't actually achieve the real traction until you're able to rewire 
the mindsets uh, and the behaviors inside of the company. And that's where the culture map is actually a really powerful tool because it helps you connect the outcomes that you want mm -hmm. with the behaviors that you need and then the management actions that will enable uh, those behaviors that you actually want. So it is a it is a very simple tool. It's mm -hmm. actually deceptively simple. It's just a three uh, row, three rows. And um, um, it, however, it's an incredibly powerful tool because it enables you to to focus on and find and focus on those things in your organization, those structural things that you can actually change that will actually drive the behavior and the outcomes that you're trying to achieve. Mm. And so on, on the culture map, Dave, are you able to talk us through how one would approach it? I mean, is it simply a matter of getting X number of people together to walk through the different uh, columns? I mean, you've got outcomes sort, uh, you've got behaviors that I guess a BAU, and then you have your enablers and blockers. So, what, how would that play out? You, I reckon, I, I, it's it's really not fair to ask someone inside of your company to facilitate mm -hmm. a culture mapping session because everyone is part of the system, and uh, so I recommend that you do bring in someone from outside, even if it's just a friend uh, or a consultant that you're comfortable working with. Mm -hmm facilitate those conversations someone who doesn't have anything to gain or lose sure. has no skin Makes I, sense. I think that's really, really important uh, because everyone when it comes to culture change there always will be winners and losers mm. and it, you can't take power and power dynamics out of the equation when you're talking about culture so it's important I think to get a neut relatively neutral uh, party to help you facilitate it to uh, reflect back mm -hmm. um help reflect back to you what you're dealing with I think but I what I do recommend is that you get together five or six people in different parts of the organism from from who are comfortable working together comfortable talking to each other comfortable mm -hmm. being honest with each other and that you don't just conduct one culture mapping session you conduct several many um, because every the finance department will have a culture the sales sure. group will have a culture the sales group in Singapore will have a different culture than the sales group in Melbourne. The mm -hmm. uh, the retail group, the uh, manufacturing group, the warehouse group, they will all have their own cultures. And it's important that you actually see them all. So number one, uh, I think you want to have those conversations within a group of people who are already comfortable talking to each other. And what you're asking them to do is to talk about the stuff that they already talk about, but unofficially. Mm. They talk about it during their breaks. They talk about it um, uh, when they're in the pub together. They don't talk about it officially at work because most workplaces are not a place where you can bring your feelings and your motivations and, and that kind of stuff legitimately into a conversation. Mm. But what we're doing essentially with the culture map is we're saying this is the kind of organization that we know we need to become. We're not smart enough to figure out how to design the business structure and the incentives and all those things that will help us create that organization. Mm -hmm. That's the old way of doing things. The old way of doing things is we, we create the carrots and the sticks and we give you the line that you need to walk and you design that and you follow the procedures and you just do as you're told. And if you, if you do a great job, you get a carrot and if you do a terrible job, you get a stick. Yeah. And, and that's the way that we used to do it, but we're not that smart anymore. We don't even know what we need to do. We, we, we know this is the way we need to be. Help us design the organization and help us design it so we can continually evolve it as mm -hmm. we learn. But you tell us, you know, uh, don't, you know, we're not gonna, we're not gonna tell you this is your job now. Stop selling this thing, go sell this thing. Mm -hmm. We're telling you this is where we need to go as an organization. We know that it's gonna involve a lot of people and a lot of people changing. Uh, behaviors, but we don't know how to design the system to enable that. So tell us, if this is the person we want you to be, if this is the kind of work that we need to get done, tell us, how can we design this organization so you are not just willing, but jazzed and excited to come in and be that person and do that work and get that outcome mm -hmm. every day? How, what do we need to do as an organization to enable that, to make that happen? And if you can imagine, when a, a neutral third party is asking that question. It actually takes a lot of trust off the company because number one, uh, 
if I'm in there as a management consultant or a facilitator asking this question, I am also going to say, I can't guarantee that we're going to do all of these things. But what I do want to know is we, we need to get this information from you so we can make these recommendations. Mm -hmm. And then from a management perspective, we're not saying, uh, well, you know, um, you have to go and ask these questions. We're saying we will help you. We will go and we will, we will talk to the organization and figure out what needs to happen. And then we'll come back to you with the best things that we have found. And we guarantee you that those are things that probably will have some uncomfortable you know, ideas there, some things that we're going to take you out of your comfort zone. However, uh, let's, not even, let's not even go down this path at all unless you're willing to take on some of that, unless you're willing to consider some big changes, even if we were only to start in a pilot area or in the zone, mm -hmm. um, you want to know before we, because if we go out and we do, ask all these questions and we get all this great information and then we come back and you don't do anything, yeah, that's worse than if we didn't do anything at all. It's worse than nothing. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's so, pretty common with a lot of innovation programs in general, where a bit of budget is put aside maybe to run, say, a hackathon or something to that effect or an idea contest, but then there's no real... Um, I suppose there's no funding, there's no time, there's no real appetite to do anything beyond that. And ultimately, it often amounts to, you know, theatre and people become disgruntled, particularly your more, I suppose, uh, entrepreneurial employees who want to create and want to add new value. And oftentimes you lose them to other organisations because of such um, exploits like innovation theatre. That's why I think it's really important to... Uh in the early stages even, to recognize and budget for mm. uh, the behavioral coaching that the senior team is going to need. And not just to say, we're going to make all these changes in the organization without having to change our own behavior, because that's not going to happen. Mm. The kind of changes that we're talking about today are not the kind of changes that is just like a reconfiguration of the org chart and business as usual with different people yeah. leading different groups. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about a, a real shift in thinking and behavior, and it involves empowering. Most of the time, it empower, involves uh, shifting power from the senior team to the front line, and that is because that's where the decisions need to be made in a complex and ambiguous environment. They need to be made closer to the customer, as close mm -hmm. to the customer as you can possibly make it happen. Yep. And if you want to enable that. If you want to actually enable that, you're not going to do it without changing significant behavioral rewiring, mental rewiring and behavioral rewiring of the management team. And because everyone looks to the management team to, to figure out what's real and what's fake and what do they really mean and what do we, when they say that, do they mean it or are they just saying it and we're just going to, someone says take risks. Mm -hmm. And then the first guy who takes a risk gets fired. Yeah. You know, well, that's not that. You know, that's common. And I think so. What I think is important for senior teams to be thinking about is how are we going to support our own ourselves? Mm -hmm. How are we going to support our own selves in walking through this? And who's going to hold us accountable for our behavior change? Yeah. Because it's not going to be us. We need a coach. We need we need someone there. Who can help us? Maybe, maybe ideally someone who's been there before, or someone who's done that, mm -hmm. someone who's gone through that. And I think that's one of the things that, one of the reasons a lot of these initiatives fail is that executives are overconfident. They think they can do it themselves. Yeah. Just like you think you can quit smoking by yourself or go on a diet by yourself, and you know you're going to be, you're going to have this workout routine, your New Year's resolution, and you don't need yeah. a personal trainer because you're going to get up every morning and you're just going to do that every day. Yeah. Well, you know. Most people do need a little help, whether it's a peer group. It doesn't have to be some coach coming in. Sometimes it's peers, you know. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's peers holding each other accountable. But there, there needs to be a significant focus on that leadership mindset and behavioral stuff. Mm. And it's, 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 uh, it's often gets short shrift. Yeah, yeah, and it's funny you mentioned uh, New Year's resolutions as well. I think uh, I think ninety percent of New Year's resolutions are busted by the end of January, and I think that speaks volumes about senior managers who think they can do it all themselves as well. Um, 
And so on the culture map, I mean, you've talked about running a number of different workshops across different uh, functional lines um, to identify some of those enablers and blockers and some of the behaviors that we need to, um, I suppose, foster to support that culture change. Um, would you say, I mean, I'm a big believer in learning by doing, and I feel that the Lean Startup philosophy itself should be applied to these innovation programs um, so organizations can learn by doing, taking small bets, seeing what works for them. Um, would you say the culture map tool lends itself to, say, running a program or an innovation sprint for three months and during that sprint I imagine the team identifies blockers um, whether they're finance whether it's marketing whether it's sales or IT and then you can I suppose gradually complete a culture map and say okay this is what we've come back with we ran this three month innovation sprint um, this is what worked and this is what stopped us I mean it may have been a policy where it said well the market size needs to be this big otherwise we're not going to invest in you and therefore there's a blocker um, from finance and how do we get around that and so on would you say it lends itself to that yeah I think it does because you 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 the three layers are outcomes behaviors and enablers slash blockers mm -hmm. you um, it's not too hard. Most organizations have ways of talking about behaviors. What did we do? What are we doing? What have we done? Mm -hmm. They're used to talking about results. What did we get? What were the outcomes? What happened? Uh, what did we get that we didn't like? What did we get that we did like? Mm -hmm. What do we want to get more of? Um, what are the behaviors that we need in order to get that? Organizations are pretty good at having those conversations about those first two levels. Mm -hmm. The enablers and blockers is where you... you uh, it's really powerful for the culture map to actually help you make those connections because then you could say, well, um, we had this problem and we, here's a problem that we had and this behavior that we just keep doing. And someone says, uh, okay, well, how can we enable this other behavior? Well, let's change a process or let's add a new rule. Mm -hmm. Okay. And they say, okay, well, we're going to change the process. We're going to add this new rule. But what you will also want to ask is, well, why do we think a rule or a process is the answer. Why is it, what is it about our behavior that we're always proposing a new rule or a new process? And what is it about our culture that makes us lean in toward rules and processes? What else is there? Mm. What else, if we couldn't give ourselves a new rule or we couldn't give ourselves a new process, then what would we need to do? Well, we might need different, um, incentives or mm -hmm. we might need a different uh, layout here yeah. or we might need it and I think the the the, the, the real uh, powerful insights come from a degree of self-awareness of an ability to ask yourself well why do we not just how do we solve this problem but why do we solve problems in this way mm -hmm. Why do we have this approach to solving a problem? Mm. Why is it that we always, well, we're going to write a software fix? Well, why is it that software is the thing that we're going to fix? Yeah, sounds like organizational emotional intelligence. That's exactly what it is. Mm. Being a bit more yeah, introspective. I, think, I don't think you can have the organizational emotional intelligence until you have it for yourself. Mm. But I think there's a, uh, when it comes to culture change, I guess I'm coming back to this as a sort of a theme today. Personal work is an important part of that. And the more senior you are in the organization, the more important it is for you to do that personal work. Yeah, the more introspective culture, you need to be, I think. Self-aware. Mm. Yeah, I mean, we, we influence by our own behavior. We, we influence the systems that we interact with all the time. Mm -hmm. And it's, very, it's a very 20th century um, I, idea and approach that as senior executives, we are outside the system and we are kind of designing the system and we operate on the system as opposed to from within the system. But we are all also always within the system and we cannot separate our behavior from the behavior of other people. People act in such a way. Any executive team um, is like a family. Mm -hmm. They're spending a lot of time together. Um, they're going through hard times together. They're going through good times together. Um, the same dynamics will play out in any team that play out in families. Mm -hmm. Dysfunctional routine, you know, distancing, um, uh, conflict, um, cutting off each other, cutting off communications. I'm not going to talk to you, yeah. or, or I'm going to avoid you. Um, cold, silent treatment. 
Uh, you know, all those things that, that play out in family dynamics also play out in, in work dynamics. And to say that you are not a part of that, to imagine that you're not actually influencing everything that's going on by your own behavior is a, is a it's a dangerous fiction. Mm. And I think that's probably a, a much deeper sort of philosoph- philosophical uh, question. Um, I mean, some of what you've said there resonates or reminds me of this book, The Four Agreements, where one of the agreements is being impeccable with your word because everything you say, do, and feel essentially influences behavior, whether it's influencing someone else's behavior or influencing your own. And if you're in a position of senior authority within an organization, you wield a lot of power, and anything you say or do can be um, taken by people lower down the food chain or, your, or even your peers up, up in the C-suite. Um, and can be taken um, perhaps in ways that it was not meant to be taken and therefore can have um, disastrous effects on culture. Absolutely. I'll give you an example from a a woman named Carolyn Taylor. I think she actually started in Australia, although she lives in Bermuda now. Mm -hmm. She was one of the people that I interviewed when I was working on the culture map. and uh, She told me a story about a guy that she worked with, a senior Mm -hmm. senior leader, and... um, he had a tendency to shoot the messenger. So if you brought him bad news, you were the problem. Yeah. Well, over a period of years, Mm -hmm. um, he stopped hearing bad news. And he, so the problems that he needed, most needed to be dealing with, he was completely unaware of Mm because no one wanted to be the person to tell him. And he, when he first came to Carolyn, he, his thing was, well, I don't know what's going on around here. Mm. Um, I'm the boss, and I don't know what's happening. I don't know what's going on. Well, he was very, he was not aware that it was because of his own behavior that he didn't know what was going on. He was actually training the organization to hide bad news from him over a period of many years. Yeah. So how do, how do you deal with, how do you create change in an organization when everyone's afraid to tell you the truth? Yeah. Well, what, what they, and that's what I mean by starting with behavior. He had to start with his own behavior, mm-hmm. yeah. and he basically had to start training himself out of his own routines. When he got news that he didn't like, he had to take a deep breath. He had a little, they gave him a little card to look at, or you know, take yeah. three deep breaths. You know, just relax. <laughs> yep. Ask. Here's some questions you can ask. That's like quitting smoking. Yeah. That's 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 literally that's what I mean by rewiring yourself, rewiring your behavior. And it's, it's the kind of thing that's hard to do without a coach. Mm. It's hard to do without support. And uh, whether it's the consultant that you trust or your peers that you're, you're going to be. Um, and, and the thing is, it's it, for senior executives, many of whom have got there by hiding their vulnerabilities, by appearing to be heroic and, and invulnerable and always right, it's very hard to allow that coaching in. Because you have to be be vulnerable. You have to basically admit to your vulnerabilities in order to be able to work on them. And you have to be transparent. You have to be able to say to your organization, I'm working on this. Mm. Help me work on this. This is something I'm working on. Yep. Um, that means admitting to your own organization that you're not perfect. And that's a hard thing to do, especially if you see yourself as a leader. And especially if you're feeling like you're in dangerous or difficult times. Mm-hmm. want to be the person that people look to for certainty yeah. you know, um, there's a lot going on there uh, I think to, to be able to be vulnerable, to be able to say to your team you know, we're, we're going to need to change mm-hmm. and I'm going to need to change yeah. just, we're going to need to change in order for us to change I have to change too and it's not any more comfortable for me than it is for you it's uncomfortable Mm-hmm. But we're going to do it. I'm going to do it. We're yeah. going to do it together. Here's what I'm promising you. Mm. Yeah, that's, You're never going to get in trouble for bringing me bad news. Yeah, and I think that's exactly right. And um, I think there's so many, so much going on here, whether it's psychological or even physiological. I mean, you talk about 
senior managers always wanting or feeling as if they need to have the right answers. I mean, it's a big part of their identity. They've been lauded for it, that they are where they are in, in society because of um, their performance um, to date, which may have been in an environment that was a little bit more stable um, and it's gotten them this far, but now perhaps it's a bit more unstable and they need to um, embrace bad news. But even on, in the physiological side, I mean, you mentioned... Here's the bad news. Take three deep breaths. Think it through. Respond with reason, not impulse. And you know, physiologically, you've got the amygdala in the brain, which is all about sensing danger and fear. And I think it's um, sensory um, abilities. It's like ten times more profound than any other part of the brain. So it just latches onto any change in, in your environment, any fear, any any danger, and, and therefore it's going to help. It's going to prompt you uh, to respond with that impulse and just shoot the messenger. So. You know, we're, we're, mess- we're, I suppose, dealing with culture, psychology, physiology. There's so much going on here that organizations have to deal with in order to, um, I suppose, start changing their organizations for the better. Yeah, and you see, I mean, it's easy to get into vicious cycles as well. You know, you, you're getting pressure, you're getting market pressure, sales are going down. So once sales start going down, then you start to put more pressure on the sales team, mm. which actually makes it harder for them to sell and it takes their confidence away because they can't say no to anything. So now the sales team feels like they have to sell yep. anything and they start, you know, you, you create stress and that stress makes it harder for people to be creative and harder for people to think and yep. they're going to settle back. When What people do under stress is, is what you need to focus on. What people do under stress, if they're going to... Re- the tendency is to revert into old behaviors. Mm. How are you going to have new behaviors that you can do under stress? Well, you have to find ways to de-stress the organization. And that, and the first step to de-stressing the organization is to de-stress yourself. Mm-hmm. And how do you de-stress yourself? I can't think of anything better than three deep breaths. That is a power, that's probably yep. one of the most powerful management tools I know of. Mm-hmm. Well, deep breaths. Yeah, you know, if it puts you in a, in a, in a place of clarity and, and calm and you can make better decisions and ultimately that's what they're paid for, right, making decisions. And if you can't make decisions from a place of clarity, then the organization suffers. Um, and I think you've touched on a great point there on, um, you know, bad news, uh, bad results, failure. And I, I know the culture map actually touches on identifying behaviors that are rewarded and those that are punished, um, which I think is really important, uh, particularly in organizations, or particularly today where, you know, small failures, uh, I suppose, are absolutely critical to discovery and supporting creativity and innovation. Yeah, the culture map is a great tool. It's a fantastic tool for asking the right questions and connecting outcomes, behaviors, and enablers. Uh, But it's only a tool. It's no more useful in, I mean, you have to have also someone who knows how to use the tool, practitioners. Mm-hmm. Um, the good news I have for you, uh, Steve, is that I spent three months in, or no, sorry, a month in Australia mm-hmm. uh, in last year, and I trained a bunch of people on using this tool, a bunch of organizational consultants and really awesome, great organizational development practitioners. And so people in Australia are, business people in Australia are in a really good spot because there are a bunch of people there that have been trained on it. There's mm-hmm. a group on LinkedIn where you could go and find them. Um, so uh, there, is a, there is a bunch of skilled people out there who are ready, and willing, and able to pick up a culture map and, uh, and uh, help you move this stuff forward. So I do think that's, um, that's good news. Yeah, definitely, definitely couldn't agree more. I think, and I think Australians in general are, I suppose, open to doing things a different way. However, you do still have that culture at many organizations, particularly um, large financial services companies, where there is a little bit of that, well, there is a little bit, maybe an understatement, but that res- underlying uh, resistance to change. And as we've discussed today, there's a lot going on um, there, and it's not an and it's it's definitely no overnight solution. And I think that's something that's synonymous, not just with culture, but with corporate innovation. I think 
organizations need to stop looking for a silver bullet and basically start learning by doing experimenting, identifying what works, what, what the blockers are, what the enablers are, and slowly but surely moving towards um, I, I guess they'll never get to Nirvana because the underlying business environment will always move, but as, as quickly as you can move um, in step with that moving business environment, the better it will be for that company. Um, yeah, I actually had um, had the opportunity to spend, as I said, quite a bit of time there. And, mm. um, I worked with the Australian industry group, so I got to meet a number of um, uh, different kinds of businesses. Australia has some unique uh, strengths and some unique challenges. Mm. Uh, one of the strengths is that uh, you have a very good um, social safety net in Australia that people have a pretty yep. decent, um, and that's that does de-stress the whole culture in Australia pretty well. You, you know, people can you know do okay if they lose their job or if they they have a um, problem. So that is that's actually right. a strength I see mm -hmm. in Australia. That that's a de-stressor right there. Um, there's a shrinking industrial uh, base, though. So the manufacturing side of um, the uh, um, Australian economy is, sh is shrinking. Yeah. It's being taken over by China. So it's going to require a shift in thinking toward more service innovation, more technology, more of those um, higher value solutions and services. So mm -hmm. that's, that's a challenge. Um, there's another challenge that's cultural that is a sort of an Australian cultural challenge, which is the tall poppy syndrome. Yes. You may have heard of. So there is something there that is uh, kind of uh, working at cross purposes to innovation and experimentation and uh, that stepping out and trying something different and trying something new. So there, there are some challenges and there are some strengths. And I think that uh, my one of my one of the things that I think is one of the greatest strengths in Australia is that but partly because of the social safety net mm -hmm. people truly want a job they can enjoy people are looking for a job that they want a job they can enjoy that they love to do that they like to do and that's actually the power uh, that's a credible incredibly powerful continental thing it's your your whole country has this um, strength Mm -hmm. is that people will self-select into work that's fun and engaging and really rewarding. So if you, as a business person, if you can create the environment that is that fun place that people really want to work where they really can enjoy the job, you're going to have no trouble attracting great people. Because, I mean, it's a really hard-working culture. It's a cheerful culture. It's a happy culture. It's a very collaborative culture. And I think that's um, there's a huge amount of potential uh, to be more of a uh, global uh, force than I think even a lot of people in Australia even think. Yeah, yeah, I think you've touched, I mean, that's that's quite interesting you should say that because we do have this social safety net, great healthcare, education and, and so on, yet we have this culture of I suppose being quite conservative and avoiding risk, which is a, I guess that harks back to our colonial days as a, as, as a member of the Commonwealth and Whereas in the United States, um, perhaps the social safety net isn't as wide, yet the culture is steeped in taking risks and, you know, entrepreneurial thinking. So it's quite interesting how the tables kind of turn. Yeah, I think that's that's part of the... the you, you could probably do a culture map just for the whole of Australian culture because one of the things that's powerful when you start thinking about culture is it will have, if you start really examining it and diagnosing and diving deep into your culture it will help you see both your strengths and your weaknesses and it will help you design um, structures that will take advantage of your strengths and minimize your weaknesses and I think that's one of the things that I think is maybe one of the most important takeaways around culture is there there is no such thing as one perfect culture the culture is going to be a combination of what are your unique strengths and what are the what are the challenges that the environment is bringing to you and how do you actually find and create a great fit between those two things. Mm, that's great, and I think there's some lessons there for our federal government who are currently embarking upon uh, what they call the National Innovation and Science Agenda. So um, I think if they can help change the culture at different parts of whether it's government, um, industry, you know, university, small to medium enterprise, and so on, I think it can only help um, achieve some of those objectives. Um, but I think I am about to uh, get to the point of the program where we close out with a bit of fun, Dave. Um, and so this is where I ask all of my guests two hypotheticals and one on lifestyle design. 
So Sorry about the background noise. I think one of my neighbors is uh, trimming their edge. <laughs> well, it's, it's almost summer, right? So they're, they're, ge they're gearing up for those barbecues. <laughs> um, so, Dave, if you could work for any company at any stage of their company life cycle, who would it be and why? Wow, what a great question. I think so. <laughs> I think it would be Amazon. Okay, why Amazon? Uh, well, I see... Jeff Bezos as the Henry Ford of the 21st century. Mm -hmm. I think you know, I wrote a book um, called The Connected Company, where I tried yep. to really understand what is the blueprint for the 21st century organization. Mm -hmm. uh, if someone had gone back 100 years and could talk to Henry Ford, and that they would have had a great opportunity to learn about uh, all the things that would eventually become the modern industrial organization, or at least most of them. Mm -hmm. them. Yeah, and with and, sorry, go on. Well, and I see Jeff Bezos as the Henry Ford of the 21st century. He's actually, uh, when, I, when I compared the Connected Company blueprint to all the companies I could see in the world, the only company that was doing all of those things mm -hmm. in the blueprint was Amazon. Yeah. And uh, there are many companies that are doing some of them, but Amazon is actually doing all of them. Amazon is doing um, highly, um, on one side of their business, they're highly structured on the stuff that's stable, the, mm -hmm. the, the parts of the environment that are relatively stable, like warehousing and shipping and distribution. They're organized in a kind of industrial Henry Ford-ish kind of mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. um, but on the other side, the part of their business that is very volatile, like the web, uh, you know, streaming video and uh, internet infrastructure and that kind of stuff, they are organized in a completely different way, uh, very much, very agile, very lean. Um, and I think he, he's just a brilliant man. He's figured out a ton of stuff, and he's not necessarily out preaching it from the roof, rooftops, nor should he. I mean, he's, he's also likes to win. So, um, But if you were actually, I think he, in the early days of Amazon, he was a little bit more transparent. If you go back and you look at some of the mm -hmm. videos where he would actually talk more transparently about uh, his philosophy and his thinking. Mm -hmm. And I think if I was able to work there in those early days when they were all in one room and they had a, literally, a, they would ring a bell when they sold a book, uh, I think I could have learned a tremendous amount. Mm. Um, that's where I would have, that's where I would have wanted to be yeah great question uh, great great answer great answer and I think on being a connected company essentially that's companies that are all about engaging with their employees their partners customers and the public to support associational thinking innovation fresh insights and just partnerships that will help them scale at a much quicker rate Mm. Um, so question number two, Dave. Uh, brace yourself. This is another tough one. Um, if you could ask anyone a question, dead or alive, who would it be and why? Just one question. <laughs> wow. Uh, I think I would ask, I would probably go back to um, uh, Thomas Jefferson and ask him what mm -hmm. he really meant by the Second Amendment. Right. That's interesting. The Constitution. The one about the right to bear arms. What was yeah. that? What was, was that such a such an interesting point yeah. right now? I think um, I have no idea what his answer would be, but I I think I would try and explore that with him. Mm. And I, I dare not touch the the issue of the right to bear arms in, in the United States, but I guess to to tie it back to our conversation today, it may be one of those things where once upon a time um, the business environment, if we'll call it that, um, supported firearm ownership and whatnot, and perhaps the business environment has changed, and whether or not it still supports it or not is not for me to say, so I'll leave it at, at that. Oh, I'm, I, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to come down on either side of it either. I, I'm, just, I'm just kind of curious what he meant. Mm, yeah, definitely. Mm. Um, and, and English, so I could ask him. You know. Yeah, well, that's right. I think uh, we, we actually get a lot of our, our guests going back to that. that part of history and asking people, like, whether it's Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin... Um, Abraham Lincoln um, questions, so you're definitely not alone there. Um, and Franklin would be a more interesting guy to talk to, actually. Yeah, it's a bit more of a trailblazer, all right? Yeah. Mm. Um, and finally, the question is on lifestyle design. So, you know, you've written a number of books now, um, doing some great work with your consultancy, traveling around the world, giving keynotes, running workshops. How does Dave Gray stay on top of his game? Do you have any rituals or routines? Yeah, I do. I have a, I have a, um, 
uh, a guy that I work with. His name is Mike Parker. Mm-hmm. He's a coach, executive coach. Mm-hmm. And I work with him over Skype. And um, the work that I, I do with him is really literally calibrating and tuning my own mind, rewiring it. So mm-hmm. um, it wouldn't be very, uh, probably wouldn't be very, uh, uh, it would be a little hypocritical of me to say to all these executives, you ought to have a coach if I don't have a coach myself. And I do have a coach, so I want to reveal that. Um, but I have a guy that I work with, and uh, mm-hmm. I do exactly that. Um, we work on make, you know, tuning, uh, mental tuning, calibrating to the environment, mm-hmm. uh, uh, becoming a, a better force in meetings, um, working on my own behavior, mm-hmm. both with my... And what's interesting about that kind of work is it has benefits, whether you're working on it for work or for home, it has benefits in the other place. So mm. it, uh, even though I'm the primary driver of it is my work, it has all kinds of benefits in my, my home life as well. Yeah, uh, that ties in beautifully with um, what we were talking about earlier, um, where it begins with the self and it begins with, begins with being self-aware and introspective. And then once you get that sorted out, you can start to influence the organization for the better. So. Nice way to finish it off. Um, and I guess, where can people go to find out a little bit more about yourself, Dave, and the culture map? Um, well, my company is called Explain, X-B-L-A-N-E. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's explain.com. And then I have a personal website, which is just the same thing with an R on the end, explainer, X-B-L-A-N-E-R.com. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, so that's if you want the, the organization, it's Explain. If you want me, it's Explainer. Mm-hmm. Nice and easy, nice and easy. And all of your books are available at all good bookstores, including Jeff Bezos' Amazon.com. So, um, Absolutely. thanks thanks again for I taking. All been translated into Australian. Oh, wow, really? And, and uh, English and American too? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Fantastic. Thanks a lot for your time today, Dave. You've been a wonderful guest. Cheers. Well, I hope you enjoyed my interview with Dave Gray. Um, You can always find out a little bit more about Dave at explain.com and explainer.com. There's also a culture mapping tool group on LinkedIn, which Dave strongly recommends you check out. If you're picking up what we're putting down, we'd love it if you'd spend just one minute to like, share, or subscribe to us on iTunes, SoundCloud, or Stitcher. Um, We've also recently released the Innovation Managers course, a 12-week online course for innovation managers and corporate entrepreneurs who are interested in understanding and becoming more adept at implementing and using the mindsets, methodologies, and tools that underpin corporate innovation. You can find out a little bit more about that at innovationmanagerscourse.com. And finally, if you're interested in finding out a little bit more about Collective Campus, our innovation school and consultancy here in Melbourne, Australia, you can simply head to collectivecamp.us. Until next time, Future Squared out.